I'm, I'm going to go. Uh, I, we're, we're opening for the Q and A's, right? But yes. I, I would have to leave. Would you soon, so I want to ask one question. Sure. No. What? Um, more like a comment. You've been referring to the gold standard, and that's what we uh, s should strive to get in the yes. Middle East. But subsequent attempts to introduce the gold standard in the agreements with Vietnam and some others right. didn't work. Well, they didn't work. They, so you know, yes. there is sort of a precedent that we let that gold standard slip. slip. Yeah, I think you put it better in the second sentence. Yeah. Um, Essentially, so far, Adams for Peace has been the only idea we've had since 1953, with some interventions along the way saying, you know, you need to be careful about reprocessing and enrichment, uh, forward Carter policies, and things like that. The margin of safety between bomb making and boiling water uh, has changed, I would argue, since the last time we looked at what we should be demanding in these agreements, which was roughly in 78 was the last time we listed all the conditions in what was called the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Act of 78. Uh, we visit this question usually every 30 or 40 years. We're due. And if we didn't get it last time, it's because we wanted to make the agreement more than we wanted to get it right. It was not because we insisted on it too much. It was because we did not insist upon it very much, not only with the customer, but we have never really worked trying to get the other suppliers to think about adopting this. And why? Well, because we're, we're so worried about firms like Westinghouse, which I think is, at this point, a misplaced concern. What I'm trying to tell you is that we're moving into a new period. And it's one in which perhaps people will be arguing more may be better. It's one in which the margin of safety that we assumed exists between civilian nuclear power production and bomb making is nowhere near as great as what we thought. And that the exploitation of the civil sector for making bombs, it's on the upside, not the downswing. Now, could be wrong, but that's the that's the burden of this presentation and why this is an interesting topic. If it was just about another 123, eh, not so interesting. How shall I put it? How lucky do you feel? If you don't feel very lucky, you you, you get out of the out of the garage on this diplomatically and start talking to other countries in a way we have not done yet. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, there was a point back last decade, uh, I think uh, during the first term of Bush 43, um, with a G8 establishing a yes. moratorium. Yes. Uh, on all these things, but I'm not really sure that it held all too long. No, it did not. I, you know, I always like to say to people, say, well, we tried that, it didn't work. Oh. The rejoinder would be, in politics, repetition is the soul of wit. And uh, if you don't believe that, you have not been following narratives where they just simply say things over and over again, even if they're not true, and after a while they're going, yeah, well, you got to remember such and such. Um, I don't think it's just repetition. I think we need to kind of be more candid about a couple of things. You could build more support for this if, for example, uh, the U.S. government actually assessed what the timely detection uh, goals ought to be for the IEA, what the significant quantities ought to be, uh, you know, whether or not the timeliness detection goals are sound. I know the IEA safeguards division and the, the folks who are doing future planning privately think that would be a great idea. And each time they mention they think it's a great idea, someone comes along with a ruler, <coughs> stop that. Well, maybe we can get on their side and do it ourselves. If you did, you could probably build a, a sort of a, a case for why 
maybe we need to be a little tougher on certain things. I mean, after all, the, the Iran deal, if it, if it meant anything, it was to spotlight our nervousness about enrichment and processing. I mean, you know, people debate whether it went far enough or was good enough, but that's what it was focusing on. Uh, you know, so things change. Yeah. All right. Do you have an opinion on the uh, fuel bank idea that was floated around for a while that we would guarantee fuel and take yeah. back fuel? I think it. I'll give you the, the standard snarky answer, and I'm not sh I think it's correct, um, but it has been given by others, it's not just me. Um, you know, there, each reactor uh, fuel has to be tailored. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not like you have one fuel rod design. Sure. It's not like you just pour gasoline of a certain octane into any car. So you'd have to be stockpiling an awful lot of things uh, to satisfy everyone that they were going to be able to use the bank. So the bank is uh, sort of a diplomatic talking point that, that uh, allows you to say, well, if you don't trust us, you can always trust the IEA. I think the problem with this solution is it's not clear what the problem is. I mean, how many countries can't get nuclear fuel? Except the ones that, uh, well, you know, maybe you don't want to have nuclear fuel. Well, I think the argument that was made was that it would cut off the incentive to have your own enrichment. I think the incentive isn't there to begin with. Uh, it's only there if you want to get bombs, as, as we're discovering in the Saudi case. I mean, the case for enrichment for Saudi Arabia is makes the case for nuclear power look really good. <laughs> I mean, that's how bad it is. And yet, we're accepting it as if, well, yeah, you know, they have a right to that. I mean, I, I was in a meeting where recently where someone said, well, you know, the Italians don't agree with you. And I like Italians, so I didn't feel like saying, I don't care about the Italians. But roughly, I, you know, is that the figure of merit for figuring out what we should be doing? I don't think so. Um, so I suppose the rejoinder is, there, there, another way to come at it, it's more sophisticated. Let me try this. Another thing people say. Well, we should multinationalize the enrichment uh, service system. There was an attempt. Say again? There wasn't an attempt. Yeah, yeah. well, now I'm going to tell you years. what's more interesting. You don't need to even do that. Why? Because Uranco is there already. Okay. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm really losing the bubble on what the problem. It's, it's something, I call it diplomatic physics. It's what you do when you don't know what you're doing. And you want to be seen as doing something rather than not, but you, you're not really focused on the problems that, that deserve your primary attention. And the, the bank idea was, was originated with Adams for Peace. You would have thought by now, you know, 53, you know, it would have happened. But I, I, apparently, there's neither much of a problem or much of a need for it, is my read. Hey, uh, uh, I suggest that we begin uh, uh, by giving uh, uh, for the students first and foremost. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm sorry. Everyone looks like a student here. <laughs> well, that's the whole point. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask a question, and sure. of course oh. I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert by any means in this, so it's, None of it's really a question. <laughs> by, by the way, um, there, there are no experts in this. <laughs> I, I think, that for me, I, I'm curious to know, I don't think that Saudi Arabia is willing to not get the same treatment that Iran has, and Iran has been sanctioned, of course Saudi Arabia hasn't been sanctioned, so if Iran has re, um, enrichment, yeah. Saudi Arabia wants it too. So the question is, what can be done if it's not through one, two, three, to kind of um, a gold standard one, two, three? If, if that's not going to happen, even though maybe we should continue to push ahead with that, yeah. maybe we should put that weight on on other countries. 
is there anything we can do as far as imposing additional protocol? Saudi Arabia has not signed on to the additional protocol. It's yeah. just the question I, is what else is out there? I, was thought, I thought you were going in a more ambitious direction. And oh, okay. Since you didn't, I will. Sure, thank uh, you. The short answer is you can always uh, settle for that, and, and they might bite that off fine. I don't think you should get too excited about that. Um, the additional protocol, after all, is something which, if you understand how it works, it reduces the frequency of inspections. Okay, I think that might not be the first thing that would occur to me to solve this problem of what Saudis are up to, but okay. Nobody seems to know that that's what it does, and so it sounds good because it says additional, and wow, we like additional, so we say that. I think, though, you were on to something else when you were pointing out the Iran problem. That one is real. Now, it seems to me that it's quite interesting that whenever I argue for something that looks like universal or large-scale standard for a lot of countries, I'm told I'm unrealistic. But when, when people want to back off the standard, they say, well, we have to have one standard for everyone. Uh, you notice there's a kind of dialectic which works backwards from we must make the sale and we can only tolerate so much with regard to restrictions. You, know, you may want to reverse that order and say, well, you know, maybe we want to do all we can to stop bombs from being made and see how much nuclear power we can tolerate. Putting that aside, I think you can have, and we have had, very arbitrary and different treatment of countries on the basis of how much leverage we have over and what we can get away with. Finally, let me come full circle back to you and what I thought you were arguing with regard to the problem with Iran. I think there is a problem, rightly so, that we should be sympathetic to with regard to the Saudis because they are getting different treatment than Iran. But that doesn't argue for making the Iran treatment more prevalent. It rather argues for something that Mr. Trump has not yet argued. I made this clear in the hearing uh, last week. He's not tough enough. Now that's a, that that's jarring to the ear because then you know he's supposed to be Mr. Tough Guy. Right? <laughs> so what he needs to be doing is trying to figure out and demand that Iran transition to a gold standard as well. They need to enrich and have uh, power, nuclear power. Uh, like you and I needed in our backyard to mow the lawn. I mean, if, if you know anything about the oil and gas situation, uh, and to say nothing of the renewable possibilities in Iran, there's a study. You can go, it just was finished, we just posted it this week. It doesn't make any sense there either. We should be helping these countries develop non-nuclear alternatives. And we can even get the folks in Germany who love talking about this to help out, and other places in Europe. And we should be offering this even to Iran. Because as long as they persist in having that program, they're going to persist in arguing they need to recycle eventually. And definitely they need to enrich now. And as long as that's the case, you can have Isn't that the grounds for the agreement? Say again? That is the ground for the agreement as it stands, that they have How shall I put it? You know, I studied under a man who, who pointed something out that everyone here, and, and even myself, needs to say every day. It would be nice if we could just stop making our mistakes hereditary. We did as well as we could with Iran. That does not mean that it is the standard we must repeat. If we can do better, we should try. Now, I don't know that we can. But I do know that we're not trying. So I'm not sure <clears throat> what the answer is to that one. I always say, if there's little regret or high investment to find out how you can do better, do it. we got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation. One question regarding Saudi nuclear ambitions. I've heard statements that like Saudi diplomats tell people that they would get the nuclear weapon within six months if Iran gets one and stuff like that. Yeah. And I remember a few years ago it was a big issue that Iran has like uh, Saudi Arabia has like the option to buy Pakistani weapons off yeah. the shelves because of investment in the program. Right. Whether that's serious or not is another question. But are these discourses still taken seriously in Washington, like the Pakistani Saudi nuclear? 
Well, I don't, you know, the, the matter uh, of what's taken seriously in Washington probably is not one you need to burden yourself too much with because it may not be valuable. Um, but let's answer the question, should they? That might be more interesting. Um, I think in the short run, there's a lot of kibitzing that makes sense to say, you got to be kidding. I mean, you know, Saudi Arabia. However, I think it's a mistake increasingly to dismiss uh, nascent efforts. First, because there's just a lot more that's available on, on technology, which was you know, perfected roughly in 1944, 45. That's a long time ago. Um, there's a lot of code information. There's a lot of design information. There's, there, as some of you know much better than I, lots of ways to procure and break down item A into the subparts of item A and, you know, collude it back together. I think the long game is not in assuming that they can't figure out long division, whoever that they are. And the sooner you intercede, the better, because, and, and it's, it's I stated in the book in the last few pages, in Washington, you, you asked about Washington, first they tell you there's no problem, and then when they're finally convinced there's a problem, then they say, oh, there's no solution, it's too late. You cannot be too early on this stuff, and that we're hearing that it's very hard for them to do and we should take it seriously. It's just an inducement for a smart person to say, okay, well, let's get going doubly quick now while we have a chance. I don't know if that helps. It's sort of a way of ordering the information and making sense of it rather than glorifying, oh, well, there's not a problem. I've seen this written up, there's not a problem. Well, yeah, until there is. <laughs> the malice of intent clearly is out there. That we do not have to doubt. Yes. Washington does actually believe in its own yeah. universe is in place by its own rules, quite different than the rest of the world. Yeah, that's true. Uh, okay, any more questions? Yes, please, go ahead. So, uh, coming back to the Iran deal, I read your nuclear Wild Wild West paper. And I <laughs> oh, you actually read it? Yeah, I read it. Now I you know. realize this is seditious behavior. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the uh, reason you pay so much money to come here is you can engage in this without being penalized. <laughs> Reading. Yeah, so go ahead. Yeah. Well, so I definitely agree that uh, I think one of the keys is reaching some kind of gold standard with regards to the Iran deal. Eventually. I guess my question to you is how feasible do you think that actually is? And I know Trump's, you know, he's talked about glaring flaws in the deal, and I'm thinking maybe that might be what he's referring to. No, well, I, I might no. be giving him too much credit. Yeah, yeah you might be. <laughs> you might be. I, I don't know what he's thinking, uh, I think. But I mean, it's very clear that you want to extend the limits, the time, the, the time when the limits on enriching would fall aside. I mean, that is pretty clear. I don't think he's yet to saying they should get out of this business. But they should. It makes no sense, and, unless they want to bomb. And, um, as long as those things are spinning, you got a problem. You know, I don't care what the limits are that people say they're on there. It's a problem if they have them at all. Uh, in the short run, you'd have to have uh, unbounded optimism to think that you could uh, appeal to their better instincts. However, I think if you had a follow-on deal, there might be... Um, at some point, if not under this administration, perhaps under another, uh, certain kinds of inducements that would not be as hazardous as some of the ones we've engaged in. Um, my favorite is helping them with non-nuclear energy. I don't think that runs the moral hazard quite as much as freeing up assets that could be used possibly for nefarious reasons. Um, you know, you, you might open up an embassy. You, you, you might even make them have to perform to get into um, sort of the World Trade Organization. You know, they'd have, of course, these are, in some cases, bitter pills. In other words, they'd have to start thinking about whether they really want those 100 families that run the economy to continue to run. I, I don't know, but it seems to me that... Uh, 
halfway between supporting what is not a very pretty government uh, and uh, inducing them or putting them in a moral conflict about this, uh, you could get some traction. I, I don't know. Also, uh, governments don't last forever. Uh, we act like we're going to last forever. I'd like to think that's true. Uh, but there's not much uh, evidence that anyone has ever pulled that off. And so there may be changes. You, don't know. you need to be prepared for that. I think people, we, we prepare for bad things better than we do for good things. And the failing to be ready for the good things can produce disasters equally as bad as not being ready for the bad things. Uh, I, I remember our inability to deal with the fall of the wall. Uh, has put us at crosswise with Russia in a way I'm not sure is absolutely necessary. I mean, there are limits to how much you can make a Russian happy, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're at any risk of having gotten there. <laughs> I, I, from the laughter, we have affirmation over here. <laughs> Does that help? Yes, go ahead. Please, please. Sir, regarding uh, Saudi Arabia's motivation for actually achieving some sort of agreement with the United States or with some other party for procurement of yeah. nuclear energy, do you think that it is more or less likely that they're going to try and seal something with the United States prior to a renegotiation of the Iran deal? Or well, it looks like it. And, and the only question is, the, the, um, the Saudis, uh, apparently we have someone headed over there to talk about the text that we gave them. Uh, to presumably either make adjustments or persuade them to sign it. Um, I think we've got the cart before the horse. I think the Iran thing, as I say, I'm not a big fan of it, but if you are a big fan of it, we're both in agreement that we ought to figure out what we're going to do about that first before you start playing a game of diplomatic nuclear chicken with a Saudi deal. There's no rush. Last I checked, at least it can be argued that whatever nuclear power they need, if it was delayed, you know, four months, it wouldn't matter. I think that one's pretty safe. So, yeah, I think that's a concern. I mean, my my uh, political nose, and I, I was on the phone this morning with people on the Hill. Uh, you know, I was encouraging them to press all the buttons on a number of things to influence the negotiations to understand that if they succeed but in sealing a deal that is pretty permissive, they might end up encouraging legislation they do not want, and that that might get them to slow down and think about how they arrange those terms. Um, I don't know that they won't get there before they get the message. <laughs> you know, it could be that they sign and seal it before anybody says, okay, well, now I've got bad news. We're going to have some legislation where we're going to have to vote on this. And who knows if that succeeds? It may be that as soon as the deal is sealed, people lose heart and don't want to do that anymore. One of the fun things about politics is you're dealing with, uh, you know, politics, polity, the people. I'm so old uh, that you might remember. You look like you're my age cohort back there. People are funny. Do you remember that show on TV? Yep. They are. <laughs> Hard to know exactly what folks are going to do. And, uh, yeah. Well, so along, along those same lines of that comment that you just made then, if um, this is personality dependent, where is that particular <coughs> personality or that center of gravity at within our current administration who's carrying the water for this particular That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Uh, it may or may not be there. I, I don't think that... I, you've got to believe that the, the Crown Prince said what he did on 60 Minutes because that had been said before, and that he had said it in the presence of probably someone pretty senior in the U.S. government, and he thought it was okay to say it again, and it wasn't. That suggests that you may be on to a very good observation, which is the folks upstairs in the current administration think this is hunky-dory, and they like it. Uh, and they don't have reservations about it. And they keep repeating this narrative, which you see Mr. Perry say and the President say, 
well, you know, we don't want to buy Russia. We don't want to buy her. It's like, yeah, but the odds of that happening are so low. Um, and when they, they say, you know, then they say, well, we, we don't want to buy French, uh, with all due respect, if they buy French or you know, Westinghouse, uh, one pundit put it, well, that might be a, a perfect solution to the proliferation problem because they'll never get built. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think they read the same newspapers we do. They go to Georgetown. Maybe there's some students here. You know, it's not like these people are from some dark side of the moon. So, but I think your point about the personalities is is a pretty serious point. And you know, that would uh, argue that well, it's all set. But people are funny. You don't know. I mean, it, so the president, even minutes. the president, has changed his mind about certain things. So you think from the 60 Minutes interview that that there had to have probably been precedent for that? Because just my read of it was, MBS has a tendency to plant things for his Western audience, and he made a video comment about women are not obligated to wear the abaya in that 60 Minutes interview, which goes against many things that I mean. He also plants this whole thing about women being allowed to drive as carrots for Western audiences, I almost read any comments towards nuclear agreements within that 60 minute yeah. interview as leading, as opposed to being something that he had been well, in conversation you with. Know, I, you know, I don't know It's the first answer, and probably the last answer, but let me, let us reason together. Uh, what are the odds that he did that interview without any public relations assistance prior, mm -hmm. given the amount of money they're spending on public relations mm -hmm. assistance? Uh, what are the odds that that thought had never been uttered in the presence of Mr. Kushner or Mr. Trump ever before? I mean, the answer is I don't know, but you know, you, you start adding up the odds and the probabilities, yes. probabilities, and, and how should I put it? You get a different answer. But you may be very well may be right as well. Uh, I guess my suspicion is he felt comfortable doing that. I think because he had said it before somewhere. That's my hunch. Wait a second. Uh, any more questions from students? <laughs> before I give the floor to you, Nathan, I'd just like to give uh, <clears throat> an opportunity to, to students to ask more kind of questions, explore. You're paying the money, not the professors. <laughs> no, well, well that's I one mean, reason. That's right. They should get their money as well. Uh, but you're here to learn, so. Yes. Try out to learn as much as possible. Right. Okay. You mentioned <coughs> the uh, IAEA significant quantity and inspection frequencies. Yeah. And there's been great reluctance, of course, to change the significant quantity definition. Right. Uh, concomitant with that would have to be if you changed it, for example, if you cut it by a factor of two, thereby increasing the inspection frequency by a factor of two. Uh, do you see any? Uh, incentive to fund the IAEA to do that because it would be a very yeah, expensive I, proposition. I think you're raising a reasonable point, uh, but but maybe because it's so reasonable, you, you take a different approach than what you're suggesting. The the point that was being made is well, geez, if let's say the significant quantities were then the, the amount of material you need to make a bomb according to the IAEA were were halved, let's say from eight to four kilograms for plutonium and on down, you'd have to have more frequent uh, inspections and of course that costs more money and who has the money and uh, that all is fraught and that's the reason I wouldn't start with that recommendation first. What I would do is I would just simply, uh, and I suggested this to the fellow in charge many years ago after I helped create the office at the IEA uh, for strategic planning for safeguards. There was a, there's an office that does this. And I said, he said, well, how can I, you know, you're, you seem to be complaining an awful lot. <laughs> what is it that you would like us to do? And I said, well, I've got one suggestion. It doesn't cost anything. Well, he got interest in that. Because they don't have any money. I said, why don't you just simply start talking as though there's a difference between what you can, ins you can safeguard and what you can monitor. Safeguard is a kind of inspection that gives you enough warning with enough reliability for a prospective military diversion to cut it off 
at the past before it turns into a bomb. Monitoring, maybe you find out if you're lucky before, but more often than not, you hope you at least find out after they've made the bomb. Start making a distinction, and then someone will ask, well, what can we monitor and what can we safeguard? Maybe do a study and start speaking publicly about how bulk handling facilities and weapons, usable materials, do not afford an opportunity for safeguards, but only monitoring. At some point, someone will go, God, you know, we ought to do something about that. But I wouldn't tell them what to do first. <laughs> I'd leave the horse to water, and I'd be patient with it. I would not put the horse's head into the trough for just the very reasons you pointed out. It'll bolt. Buck, you might get hurt. Uh, all right, we got like five more minutes, I guess. Uh, so, any more questions, ideas, something? Well, I think this is a very important presentation. You got to let me put on um, my political science hat. Uh, the United States is the only country of, of in the world with sufficient power of, of, and influence. Uh, uh, to sign a very bad deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, the Indian case really shows that because um, no one could have actually uh, 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 done anything on nuclear side with India mm -hmm. until the United States signed uh, the one to three with them. Uh, same with the nuclear suppliers group in India. Uh, so I think it's really vital uh, that we discuss that, uh, uh, that we understand what's going on, uh, that we know that we can actually sign a bad deal and try to follow uh, developments what, and maybe uh, to get prepared in the future to, uh, to try to fix it. Yes. Well, they always say that, uh, I was trying to explain to a foundation that gives me a lot of money, they were saying, well, how can we increase our rate of innovation? And I said, well, yeah, there are a lot of innovations out there that if you killed would be the success, <laughs> rather than <laughs> the innovations that you succeeded in bringing into force. And uh, do no harm is the first requirement of anyone who is protecting a community with force, who is in a policy position, or who is a doctor. I'd like to think it would apply to lawyers, but that might be going too far. This is stretch. So, thank you so much, Henry. Okay. Yeah, I think it was uh, an exciting presentation. Yeah. And, uh,